Howdy, everyone. Earth Station One is proud to provide the following interview as part of Virtual Monsterama 2020. Uh, this year's virtual event is a fundraiser for the Motion Picture and Television Fund. MPTF supports our entertainment industry uh, in living and aging well with dignity and purpose and in helping each other in times of need. If you love movies and the people who make them, please donate. All you have to do is go to the official Monsterama site, the official Monsterama page on, on Facebook and, and click the link and, and click to donate. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, I am Mike Gordon and with me is director Mike Faber of the ESO Network. Uh, howdy. The award... <laughs> howdy, sir. Uh, we also have with us the award-winning artist, Mark Maddox. Hey, good to be hey. here, guys. Hey, sir. So and much. we are thrilled to be talking today with David J. Scull about his new book for Turner Classic Movies, Fright Favorites. Woo! That's the book. <laughs> That's the book. It's a Woo! great book. So, uh, David, I guess we'll get right into it. Tell me how this book came about. How, how did it get started? Well, usually I approach uh, a publisher with a you know, proposal. In this case, uh, Turner Classic Movies approached me through uh, running press uh, in Philadelphia and uh, they had had a lot of success with a book on Christmas themed movies mm -hmm. and uh, it did so well they said well let's uh, the next you know <laughs> most popular holiday down the down the road is uh, is, is Halloween and I uh, said yeah this sounds interesting let's talk about it and we had some back and forth and uh, the other book was about movies that featured Christmas, you know, as part of the part of the story. Right. And uh, that wasn't going to work. We s quickly realized that that if we tried to approach Halloween that way, the Carpenter franchise would, you know, just smother everything. Right. And uh, not not that it shouldn't, uh, you know, get get a lot of attention, but it would really um, uh, kind of capsize the any kind of balance and. There weren't all that many uh, films, especially good films, that plenty that you know featured jack o' lanterns somewhere in the background. Uh, but we didn't want to go that way, so we said, "What about if it's uh, movies appropriate for Halloween?" The original title was Halloween Favorites, mm -hmm. and um, so that made sense, and it also made marketing sense because you have a longer shelf life if something is not. Uh, you know, uh, completely linked to Halloween. And um, so we started talking about, uh, you know, the films. I had the idea of doing a kind of a countdown book. You know, 31 is kind of a magic number for October. Absolutely. And nobody had done anything with it before. Um, the, you know, the 31 days of Halloween kind of thing. So everyone liked that. And so the, t uh, the subtitle became 31 uh, movies to haunt your Halloween and beyond. Um, and uh, then we had to choose what we were going to do for the 31 films. And as you can imagine, uh, lots of people at Turner have, I have know a lot about film. They're very knowledgeable people and running presses, done a lot of film books. And so um, I had to uh, deftly negotiate you know, some compromises here, but the biggest compromise was we, we just can't do it with 31 films. Yeah. You know, there was maybe a time uh, back when I started uh, getting interested in, in horror movies decades ago that you could, you know, reasonably reflect in the entire genre in a, uh, in, a, in a volume of a few hundred pages. Not anymore. I mean, it has just become so vast. There are so many subgenres, so many different types of of, of horror that the best we could do is uh, give, give a reasonable uh, selection, especially to people who aren't um, diehard fans who mm -hmm. are approaching it for the first time. I mean, I, I've been publishing books about horror movies for 30 years now. So there's a whole new potential audience for me because the, uh, um, I, 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 I teach uh, courses whenever I can and uh, give guest lectures. And the students I talked to were too young to have uh, even remembered or, or hadn't even been born when, you know, the Francis Coppola Dracula was, was released. Oh, so that wow. Was really, really dates <laughs> wow. And, and so there's always uh, a new generation. And I've been, you know, I'm, I'm pretty 
I've been pretty well received, you know, in, uh, in academic circles and my books are cited all, all over the place in the academic literature. And, uh, but the uh, recruiting people to, uh, to our, uh, to become one of our kind, I, I dedicate the book to monster kids everywhere. You know who you are. And uh, people seem to have really responded to, to that. So uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to recruit monster kids. And the, uh, this was fun because you know I, I did limited chapters, but I was able to talk about individual films for a much longer um, spread than I was able to in some of my big survey books mm -hmm. where really after a few a paragraph or two, you know, you've, you've kind of done it and you have to move on to the next, you know, to the next subject. So I've always had lots of um, uh, unused research and anecdotes and, and was able to uh, uh, pull on that and lots of, I have a huge photo collection, which I have barely uh, scraped the surface of and had some wonderful uh, access to uh, 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 private collections like the, uh, the Ronald Borst collection. He's one of the great, great collectors in, in, this, in, in this field and uh, has been opening up his uh, his uh, photo files to me uh, ever since I started doing these books. So, uh, kind of a thirtieth anniversary with uh, you know with Ron too here, mm -hmm. and uh, and then of course the, uh, I had the wonderful privilege of being able to ransack the uh, Turner photo ar archives. Oh wow! Which yeah. are really amazing. And <laughs> I bet. So there are, I, one thing I just love, to, I love words and pictures, you know, uh, for the, from the time, the earliest, my earliest memories of books were dinosaur books. And I was fascinated by them. I must have, I was under 10 years old, but I knew that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make these things. I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to write the words and I wanted to draw the pictures. And so my books have been heavily, heavily uh, uh, picture dependent. Uh, and, uh, and that's the way I like it. I mean, I, I think of my books as kind of like documentaries, you know, kind of captured in, in print. And, that's, a, uh, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah, and when I started actually writing documentaries, uh, I realized for the first time that indeed my, my pro style had been uh, very informed by all of the uh, you know nonfiction television that I'd grown up with, I I just instantly fell into the rhythm of even though I was doing it unconsciously, you know there there was uh, there there was narration, there was the talking head, there was you know the uh, uh, the film clip, um, all in written form. But uh, that's what I was doing. I mean I I'm intensely visual even when I'm just just typing. So I mean, you this was in the, fun oh, because sorry. we've got, we've, no, I, I hope we've come up with uh, some images. Uh, there are at least a few that you, you've never seen before. Absolutely. And, um, some stunning prints of, of others that you haven't seen uh, in such good condition. Yeah, well, you mentioned in the, I think in the, in the intro of the foreword that, uh, you know, a lot of us monster kids grew up with sort of monster magazines. And so we're very much like, I think for all of us, we're sort of programmed. We want text, but we also want we want cool stories. We want text, and we want pictures. <laughs> so, and this book like fits that bill perfectly. Well, thank you. Yeah, people, um, it, it is. It's beautifully designed and printed. I did not. I've been involved um, in the um, in the layout and design of a lot of my books. Uh, this one, they were perfectly capable of handling it on themselves. I was happy to give it over to them. Right. Because it really, I mean, all, already I spent half the time uh, dealing with photos and um, um, locating them, enhancing them, restoring them. I mean, there, there was, there's just an incredible amount of uh, Photoshop that uh, went into this to take some hopeless uh, images and get them back into, into focus and sharpness and and get rid of the, uh, the, uh, the wrinkles and the, and the tears and all that sort of thing that, and, and do it in such a way that you, you don't notice. Mm -hmm. That's the trickiest thing about, I, I'm fascinated with, uh, 
uh, with, with, with Photoshop and um, what it can do, but it's all often used, uh, uh, used like a club and, and you don't, <laughs> and you don't believe what you're looking at. Yeah. But the, I, I've always adored the, the special patina of, you know, classic uh, film stills and it's wonderful old silver nitrate prints, uh, the, um, or uh, silver gelatin prints as they were, they were called back then. And uh, you can't fake it, you know, a dupe is a dupe. And I, uh, you know, there were a dime a dozen and uh, looking for the originals, which, you know, they ought to be digitized. And I'm doing a lot of that because the uh, uh, photographs uh, are not a permanent medium. And um, none of the, uh, the, uh, the original prints are, Going to exist a uh, you know, hundred years from now, but the uh, the special you know dyes they use in in um, uh, laser jet printing uh, can last for up to two hundred years. They tell me so. Oh. Uh, I'll be socking something away for for future generation. <laughs> but which 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 photos did, were revelations to you? Uh, well, um, I'd have to you know I'd have to look it over and and I, I'm trying to figure out once ones like really stood out for me, but um, overlooking one thing that, well, this one from cat people, like, okay, I'll show this one, right? Isn't that, that lovely? Yeah, that is a nice. beautiful publicity <laughs> photo. Um, and I will admit until I read this book, cat people was one of the movies that was missing from, I just had never seen it before. I'd never seen the original. Oh my God. So, Shame so on you. I know. Um, and then unfortunately <laughs> oh, I, I followed it up with that. Uh, curse of the cat people so um which i don't know is that in tcm's christmas book because it should be <laughs> uh no, they, they, they didn't include that one but uh, I already listen i'm already thinking the, the book has got such a strong response so far that i really do hope there will be a uh, uh fright too yeah. and got some strong ideas about exactly what i want to do with it um in this one you know the 31 films weren't enough so we, uh, my you know, second big suggested compromise is, well, what if we do a, uh, if you enjoyed this, you might also enjoy this. And uh, so we really do spotlight 62 films. And um, I think I'd like to do a book that was actually nothing but uh, uh, double features, 31 oh, wow. features for October. So who knows, we'll see how the, uh, how the sales go, but uh, People do seem to be shut in and uh... shut in. And, and this time of year, I find that a lot of people love to watch horror movies. Like I, a lot of my friends are watching a horror movie a day or, you know, uh, you know, some a week um, just to sort of get in the spirit and the mood. And and this perfect is a, this book is like a perfect accompaniment of that, like because I, I usually make my list um, and I love for uh, for. I love TCM this time of year. They do a great job with showing probably better than any other network I can think of. Uh, they show like a lot of classic horror movies and uh, and so, but they're always ones that I'm missing, right? So I always make a list and usually I have a theme, but this year you provided my theme because I just went through it and I went, okay, which one of these movies haven't I seen? And then uh, as far as, and it's, you're right, it's not just 31 movies because then you do, you know, sort of the, I guess we're all sort of accustomed to it with Netflix and Amazon. Like you might also like these, right? So you do you do one of those. And then you also, you talk about sequels, remakes, the history, like a company film. So there's like, you're probably talking about like a hundred, 150 movies in here, really. So. Exactly. I think, I think like around 120 are mentioned yeah. all, all together. But uh, even that just scratches the surface of this yes. absolutely bottomless, uh, uh, bottomless genre. It's a, it's a, it's a great book for the, to have this time of year. Um, and like I said, I, I help make my list. It helped make my list. And I watched cat people the other night and, uh, and that was, that's an amazing movie. I, I don't, uh, yeah. Shame on me for not seeing it sooner. I hope I didn't spoil anything. No, no, and... no, no, okay. no, no. Um, actually when it got to the point where, cause you do go into detail in the plot. So sometimes when it was a movie that I didn't see, I kind of was like, oh, I should probably skip the plot part of this. <laughs> but but you had probably seen the remake, right? Um, oh, for Cat People? Yes, yeah. I did see the remake. So you kind of got at least chunks of what the first film yeah, was. Yeah, I saw the, the, the nudity and the gore. I saw the Kinski version. Uh, yes. Yeah. 
for sure. So yeah, that's a bit of a spoiler too for the original <laughs> to a degree. Yeah, a little bit. But uh, yeah, I was uh, really surprised and, and it's a, it is a great movie. And a lot of these, yeah, I mean, the ones that I've seen, uh, I would, you know, I, I, it must've been difficult to narrow it down. That's all I, that's all I could say. Like, I'm like, wow, you had, you had to choose like one movie from this period and one movie from this period. But the one thing I also appreciate is you don't just talk about the movies, you talk about how they're reflecting on what was happening at the time or, you know, what, it, they're not just on the, on the surface level, they're all horror movies and they all have their plots. But underneath, with these great movies, there's always something else going on. Uh, and it's always telling us something else about the filmmakers, the time period. Um, and that's, that's really interesting as well. Yeah, that was, that's kind of been the through line of most of my, uh, my, my books on, on uh, the horror genre. Uh, that horror entertainment, scary movies and scary novels are um, set in motion by truly frightening things in the real world that we don't like to look at too directly. And uh, so somehow we process it through, uh, uh, through all the, the, the tropes and traditions of, uh, of monster movies. And uh, the first big, uh, you know, trauma of the 20th century was World War One, and uh, you know, followed by the uh, the uh, uh, the Great Depression, and then World War Two, and the Cold War, and and uh, 50s paranoia, and then the sexual revolution, and then the AIDS epidemic, and just big cataclysms um, in the culture. Um, have to be reckoned with in some ways. The, you know, the Europeans really knew this from the get-go and the prototype horror movies like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and uh, Nosferatu were, uh, they weren't Saturday matinee uh, entertainment. They were, they were art films, they were uh, message films and they had powerful things to say about uh, uh, the war just passed. Uh, Caligari is kind of a, it's a metaphor about this uh, crazed authoritarian figure, Dr. Caligari, who sends forth uh, um, a sleepwalker as if uh, he is a hypnotized soldier to kill and be killed. And, and what is, and that's very much what a lot of people uh, felt and just, just happened mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in Europe and especially in Germany. And uh, Nosferatu was another German film and uh, the filmmakers intended it to be a metaphor for the war itself, the vampire as a metaphor uh, that had destroyed uh, Europe and uh, you know, uh, had uh, drained the lifeblood. And it was in addition to the war, uh, you know, Nosferatu represents uh, the, the Spanish flu epidemic, something everybody's been talking about right. um, recently. Um, which was a kind of a plague and Nosferatu the vampire brings a plague with him to uh, yeah. uh, to uh, Bremen down he, uh, he invades and uh, so America you know was interested in entertainment and and uh, not really interested in the supernatural and for you know decades in America there were scary stories and scary characters but no supernatural monsters, no vampires, no werewolves, no ghosts. Uh, and if something spooky happened, it was always supposed to be explained away, you know, as some kind of a criminal plot, uh, uh, embezzling somebody's inheritance or uh, uh, committing some other kind of crime. And everything would be made right and explained and you could go happily off to bed at the end. Um, and uh, when came time for the studios to start considering scary stories for the talkie era. Dracula was the first property that presented itself. And uh, Universal had been thinking about it as early as 1915. There were some copyright issues with it. Stoker didn't uh, properly register the American copyright. And um, and this, this wasn't a big uh, public secret, but people in the business knew about this. And uh, so studios passed 
then in 1920, Universal announced that um, it was likely to produce Dracula as the next picture for an up and coming director named Todd Browning, who had just been very successfully paired with an up and, com up and coming actor named Lon Chaney. And uh, so a lot of the stories about uh, Chaney's possible interest you know, in Dracula go back uh, at least 10 years before the, the, uh, uh, the film came out. But uh, all the studios looked at it. It made a lot of money as a stage play. But would the movie going public buy it? Because they've never been asked to buy anything you know, like this. Uh, this was not a, uh, uh, this was not a master criminal trying to uh, pull off a heist. This was a, this was a 500 year old corpse that got up and bit your neck. And, uh, it's so silly uh, when you and, put it that way. And uh, there, the, uh, and they had some fun with it, uh, both this, the play and the movie in, in the original release, Dr. Van Helsing, uh, uh, comes out and uh, holds his hand up to the audience and and starts to reassure them uh, you know before you go home at night and you uh, shudder you know behind beneath your your uh, your blankets and you're afraid to see the uh, face at the window well just pull yourself together and remind yourself there are such things and that helped that was cut that was sadly <laughs> cut out of the film, uh, I did a little reconstruction of it with some of the missing, uh, the scraps of footage that were there in uh, the documentary I did for the uh, Universal Dracula release. But uh, that was the dilemma. And uh, they had wanted Lon Chaney to do it. Uh, Lon Chaney had such a tumultuous relationship with Universal, you know, by uh, the late 20s that I doubt that he would even uh, uh, had considered it, but that didn't stop the studios from talking to each other, the studio lawyers. And they did pass back and forth all kinds of uh, pitches and things, uh, uh, you know, for a Cheney uh, loan out, maybe for more than, than just Dracula. And it's not clear that Cheney ever even saw these, the, these offers much less, uh, it, the, the thing you hear all the time is that Cheney was slated to play Dracula. Not exactly, there were people who really wanted him to play Dracula, mm -hmm. but uh, he, the biggest kept secret in Hollywood was that uh, Cheney was dying of cancer. And um, I found it kind of amazing when I you know, got into some of the negotiation files that, that uh, nobody seemed to be aware of this. And you just look at the dates on the, the memos and the letters and, uh, um, and Isn't people it? were shocked. The world was shocked. Yeah. Cheney was really one of the biggest bankable, most famous people in the world. I mean, he, 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 was, uh, he was right up there with, uh, as an iconic uh, celebrity with uh, you know, Charlie Chaplin and, and anybody. And, yeah. Val, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, when Universal released the film they, with Lugosi, they kept, uh, at least for, for a while, some of the early advertisements uh, referred to him as Bela Lugosi, the new Lon Chaney. And uh, then they did that again with Karloff and Frankenstein. There are, there are ads you can uh, go back and look at that say, you know, Boris Karloff, the new Lon Chaney. And neither of them were. I mean, they're, they're, they were actors of uh, their own um, unique and estimable uh, you know, talents. But uh, my favorite ad for Dracula, uh, was the one I think it was in, in uh, a Vancouver paper, where you know this was not going to be one of those drawing room mystery melodramas where everything gets explained. And so across the bottom of the uh, the ad, you know, no detectives, no trap doors, which I thought uh. was that was just great. That that, that sums it up. That was just kind of it. And the public did not get trap doors or or. Uh, uh, you know, half-hearted explanations. And I think it had to do with the time. 1931 was the worst year of the Great Depression and there were no social safety nets and a lot of kind of free-floating fear and anxiety. Um, people did feel like the bottom was falling out of the world. And- um, Sounds familiar. <laughs> it, it, 
Um, imagine this, you know, times times four. Um, yeah. It, it uh, truly because things like uh, social safety nets have, hadn't even been uh, conceptualized, much much less ex exist. And it was a it was a terrible time. And I think these monster characters, and there were so many of these key films that came came out or were produced in 1931, uh, Dracula, Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and Freaks. And, um, and, I, and my mother. My mother was born in 31, so I, I tell her that, and she tells me to shut up. <laughs> you came out the same year as Dracula and Frankenstein, and then she says, shut up. But Would you couldn't ask her. She didn't remember them. She was like my students. She uh, she did say one thing. You said uh, recently, I heard you say that uh, the one, the film that started you off like, oh, my God. And it's funny because it's the same thing with me as Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was six years old and it made a powerful effect. I mean, I there are frames of that film that are, are just burned into my brain to this day. Sure. My Reading mother about talks about being in line with a long line she goes forget the you know, she goes star wars james bond goldfinger long lines frankenstein meets the wolfman long line like a really long line and that was the movie i didn't see the film but i walked into the bookstore and saw the ron cobb cover of frankenstein meets the wolfman issue 42 of famous monsters and i lost my mind i lost my that was the moment i became a monster kid the moment that so. is i think uh I had, um, I guess, previously discovered the um, uh, Forey Ackerman had a black and white photo of the original art for that. Uh, I don't know who the artist was, mm -hmm. but it was this this marvelously uh, evocative, uh, you know, the, the the battle of the century, the clash of the titans, sure. and uh, the studio used it to, uh, or the theaters used it to sell war bonds. They mm -hmm. made it a. Uh, um, you know, it helped the war effort by by uh, coming out and deciding what monster you wanted to root for. They didn't uh -huh. tell you was uh, yeah, <laughs> which side was which. Uh, but uh, well, I mean, Larry, it almost Larry looks Jones. like a boxing poster. I mean, he's sort of like like this. You know, Frankenstein's got his fist raised, and the werewolf's there yeah, with the claws, and more of a muzzle, if I remember correctly. There's 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 a wonderful. Uh, there's an exaggeration of the, of, of the forms that is, it's painterly. It's, it reminds you of things that, you know, El Greco did or, or something. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful painting. And I yeah, wonder it is nice. if it was probably uh, Universal's uh, art department. Uh, no, actually it wouldn't have been lost in a flood because all of their publicity and promo was but, done on the coast. Isn't that, isn't that ironic that it would be lost in a flood like the end of the movie? <laughs> That's it. Yeah, it it floated it away. It, it, <laughs> couldn't have, it couldn't have been all those 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 uh, uh, Morgan Litho, the printer who did those those right. fantastic stone Litho uh, posters, uh, was based in Cleveland, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that until until very recently. And uh, but uh, no, uh, Universal had its uh, uh, main offices in in New York, and uh, all the publicity and uh, distribution and things like that were, were handled out of, uh, you know, on Fifth Avenue. And uh, that's where all of this stuff would have gone. And of course, you know, it was probably all just tossed out because nobody yeah. saw purpose for it. And there were yeah. no monster collectors. <laughs> it's like all those pulp covers that were done in oils that were beautiful over those decades. And they all like 80% of them, 90% of them were tossed in the trash. Yeah, yeah that's the the Frankenstein meets the Wolfman painting is is right up there with just that classic uh, uh, like like noir uh, uh, paintings. So those artists who did the magazine covers and the paperbacks and the pinup girls and they're they're all of a continuum. It's it's this it, it was this extraordinary visual period in uh, in, uh, in in publishing and promotion that uh, we've never you know photographs kind of uh, bumped everything out mm -hmm. out of the way and uh, you, you don't see too many painterly uh, movie posters anymore i've got a, i've got a question for you you're on a desert island you've got a magic vcr and a magic tv set you're only allowed one film for the rest of your life you're never going to get rescued you got one film from now on what is it 
Can it be a special request? It can be. Well, I don't know what, what special request. Well, okay, no, yeah, I think you've given it to me. Uh, <laughs> people ask me all the time, what is your favorite, uh, you know, yeah. version of uh, and No, I mine's say, a nightmare scenario. You don't get another film. You get one and that's it. <laughs> no, I, I get, it, it is one film. I don't know who's going to put it together, but it is a, uh, it is a mashup compilation of all the great moments from all the versions of Dracula ever done. Uh, including, you know, uh, an actor from one film delivering a line of dialogue and being answered by somebody else. Uh, oh my God! <laughs> a, a that, that would be so wonderful. Uh, I, my uh, video editing skills are extremely rudimentary, so I'm not going to be the one to handle that. I'd be happy to kibitz if anybody out there wants to take this on. I mean, can you imagine having, you know, Lucy not just uh, destroyed with a wooden stake, but 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 staked like 20 times in a row yeah oh really i mean I, I when peter cushing hits that final time in the first of their dracula films i take the knob on the stereo and i go and it goes whoosh. i mean it sounds like a tree being split and everybody in the room busts out laughing another thing too one of my favorite things to use especially lately in our modern times is to use Lawrence olivier's line if i could send his soul to everlasting burning hell i would <laughs> you know but uh yeah i mean I'm, I'm now you've got me doing this now i'm like okay yeah so and so will answer from from whatever renfield's going to be talking to uh to uh anthony hopkins here in a second you know uh, dwight fry yeah. so there are some there are a lot of laugh lines you could create with, with these effects, but um, I think I'd have to consult with a number of different, uh, my, my, my favorite uh, video editors who uh, would know what to do. But um, there, there are two things, I don't mean, I mean, there's two things I wanted to tell you about. One of them was, you had said before that the word Nosferatu, that you had looked it up for like its origin or the dictionary definition or something to along those lines. It's, uh, forgive me, I'm a little vague on it. But the fact that it must, it had some resonance. Uh, years ago when I was in art school, there was a, a, a German lady that was in our art class and I went over to her and I just, just for giggles, I said, hey, uh, what do you think when I say the word Nosferatu? And a couple of my friends that knew I was a monster movie fan were standing there too with sneers on their faces. And I swear she did this. She gritted her teeth, her skin got completely covered with goosebumps and she hated horror films i knew that about her and she went Ugh. and i said what and she goes it means not alive and i said oh my god it's like i met one of the people in the village that's telling you not to go to the castle that's right you know I mean, she, exactly <laughs> but this woman had nothing to do with horror films she hated them but i asked her and that's what she said she goes it means not alive and I was like, well, in, in her world, it, it definitely had taken some form to where even the people that weren't into horror films. Uh, that's, that's, it's fascinating because the, um, uh, she didn't say not dead. No, she said not alive. Okay. Because yeah. the, the word uh, undead does mean, um, it, it goes back to Middle English and it uh, has the meaning of um, um, not dead, meaning undead, not meaning some, something still alive. It, yeah. it was this odd kind but of- in a way the, but, but in a way, it's like not dead is sort of like, okay, it's moving around. It's not dead. It, it, you know what I'm saying? Like- yeah. So it, it, didn't have a, it didn't have a spooky connotation. It, yeah. uh, so Stoker's use of it was you know, very uh, uh, unique. Nosferatu though, it's, it's ex it's an extraordinary puzzle, even, even, even yet, because uh, it does not exist in the Romanian language, mm -hmm. where it's always been. Um, I mean, the story has been it's a Romanian word meaning, meaning um, not dead or, um, or vampire, and it is not the Romanian word for vampire is vampir, mm -hmm. and so the word it just doesn't exist in Romanian. Uh, dictionaries or lexicons or books of folklore. Uh, it was a Scottish uh, a folklorist named uh, Emily Gerard, who was married to a, uh, a Romanian uh, military man and spent some time in Transylvania. And she wrote 
a, a book called uh, The Land Behind the Forest, Beyond the Forest. And uh, that is where she um, just puts forth authoritatively that uh, the, the word Nosferatu uh, uh, meant vampire. And uh, Stoker read that and he didn't have any reason to, to doubt her. But when you dig into it, it just gets more and more tenuous. Um, the, uh, the word appears in some German sources, but it's, it's not in any German uh, uh, lexicons or dictionaries. There were some German folklorists who used it and uh, it was also the alternate for it was uh, not Nosferatu, but uh, Nosferat. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it just gets to be kind of a, a merry-go-round I wondered if, uh, you know, uh, Emily Girard as a uh, non-Romanian native speaker um, mistranscribed something or, 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 or misheard something because there is, there is a word in Romanian, uh, nesuferit, that means uh, plaguesome or uh, oh, okay. um, uh, something, it's got a very negative connotation to it as an adjective. And following, you know, uh, the way Romanian works, you know, adding the, the U at the end uh, personalizes it. So uh, Nosferatu would be the, the plaguesome one, the, uh, uh, the, the one to be shunned. Uh, and yeah. that's about as far as I've been able to get with it. Um, yeah. that, that's an interesting story to tell, though. And I... The answer is probably somewhere in Germany. There are a couple of German sources that have been found pre-Stoker uh, and pre-Girard, uh, uh, pre but uh, it's it's fairly obscure. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, here's, here's another one I wanted to tell you. As a little kid, I saw Dracula for the first time. And this is, I swear this is not my imagination. The first time I saw it, you're going to go, Mark, you're wrong. You're full of crap. You're going to reach through the monitor and smack me in the face. Again? Oh, I can't wait to see that. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it's that. Got a, it's a new app it, on the phone. It, it's a William Castle effect. And I, I, <laughs> <we'll see. laughs> the, the, the maid is standing there. Renfield looks at her and he starts going, huh, 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 huh. She gets her eyes roll around and she falls on the ground and he crawls toward her. And in the end, he gets up to her face and the fly is swirling around, lands on her face and then take, and he kind of like he was going for that. And then it ended. That's what I remember. Now I saw it again. I don't remember if it was like five, six, seven years later. And I, I saw it again and I said, where's that part? Why was that cut now? I know you're looking through the monitor going, this idiot doesn't know what he's talking about, but it just seems like that no, was- No, uh, that, that, that's exactly how it was scripted. So and it was it was a fly on the face? Yeah, fly well, it was by our, he's in the Spanish version, they, they did the entire script. So you can see all the things that were uh, uh, okay. cut out. And Renfield comes over to the maid and he reaches up his hand yeah. and- as he's going for her, it's obvious that he is going for for a fly and it gets away. And he okay, I and it's funny. I feel bad about this because I've seen the Spanish version probably about three or four times, but I remember that from way back when I was a little kid. And I'm like, I mean, I was so like, wow, what happened to that? And 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 there's no cuts of it. There, it was it not filmed? Was it cut? Was it was it never even shot? Or it's what? not. It's not in the original um, continuity. Yeah. But that, I mean, they they did they they cut all kinds of things out of uh, the Browning film, about fifteen minutes worth of. Uh, Maybe my brain just with, filled it in. Maybe I knew what was going on. Than that, because there were um, prints of the uh, the curtain speech with uh, Edward Van Sloan telling right. people, you know, there are such things that uh, that were around until fairly until fairly late people did I, I talked to numerous people who you know uh, saw them uh, after 1938 uh -huh. so there were prints uh laying around mm -hmm. i don't know why there would be a uh, an odd print of uh 
with the rest of that scene in there or, yeah. and why, but it would have been probably um, an anomalous print, uh, like a work print that yeah. hadn't been, I, I don't know. The, it could, uh, be, it could just be my brain was smart. maybe maybe when I saw him. I mean, I know what he thought about spiders and flies. Maybe when he crawled over, I said, that's what he's going for. And then, but the next time I saw it, I was like disappointed because I thought I, you know, your brain kind of does some of that sometimes. Your, your brain does do that. Yeah. You, you saw some interesting uh, um, <laughs> film and they, they do exist. And I'm writing a book now, uh, the new and improved Hollywood Gothic. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I'm happy to hand over the reins. Uh, no, 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 thank you. I'm going to say this right now before this show ends. I know we only got 10 more minutes. You are to, to, to horror films and horror what David McCullough is to American history to me. I, I find oh you're, yeah, thank I you. mean, I mean, my, I, I was talking to my mom about, I'm going to be on the show with David Scal, and she goes, well, what does that mean? I said, there's going to be some serious fanny kissing from on my part on this <laughs> show, because he is my single favorite living writer. <laughs> so uh, it's, you know, it's great that you're on here. I mean, I, well, I'll, I'll, re I'll return the favor. I cannot tell you how, uh, uh, how much I think of your, your, your work. You are, you, you <laughs> kept these, these characters and these films with such photorealistic detail, uh, nobody does it like you. And it's- uh, Harley it's, Simon's it's gonna start singing. No, you, <laughs> you, you're, you're, my, you're my flat favorite and my three-dimensional favorite is, is Mike Hill. Oh, Mike Hill, uh, yeah, he is unbelievable. You're two of my favorite people. I used to, I used to paint, uh, I, I almost went to art school okay. and I paint lots of monster pictures when I was in, in uh, junior high school and high school, and I yeah. sent Corey Ackerman, and and none of them were ever uh, um, ever ever appeared in print. Although they're some sold, they're worked, sold now for big bucks. They've some have worked their way into certain people's collections, and I have a few, you know, uh, tucked away that I'm never going to frame or hang, and so I might want to uh, see what um, eBay has if eBay has any interest in them, uh -huh. um, but. Um, you, you've, got, you've got a real gift and how, where did that, uh, how did you develop that photographic? Uh, it was, it was weird. I mean, I've been drawing since 1971 and I always felt that if you got the face right, everything else was easy, but I didn't like it when I saw portraits where the people didn't look right and I would throw away or destroy anything like that. So I worked on that for, I mean, how many years is there we talking about? Is that 50, 50 years now? Uh, and I really only started the monster movie artwork about 13 years ago at Richard Clemenson's Little Shop of Horrors. I mean, I was a, mm -hmm. a, a, a corporate artist and stuff like that, but I decided I wanted more out of life and in the evening started doing that and then it became the full-time job. But, well, um, uh, but I, I, I don't just like to do the faces or anything like that. I, if a scene is missing or something like, I think I gave you a print of Dracula in the, in the drawing room. Yes, you did. Going like that. Yeah. I wanted that room. I didn't want the castle. I didn't want the water running down the walls, running down the bricks. So I literally watched the Dracula, both versions and the Spanish one too, which actually had better shots of the sets over and over and over again and built the background from all the different, you know, imagery and I wanted the, the the lady's portrait back there and and so I wanted to be like hey here's a missing publicity photograph you know what I'm saying yeah, like yes, I want to give I want to give something more because eventually even like with you discovering this uh, the photo the uh, the publicity photographs are finite mm -hmm. and so oh here comes something new anyway I'm going to give you something new you know and uh, I just showed the guys earlier a painting I'm working on uh that is taking me you know, just <laughs> forever, ever to do. I'm going to show it to you real quick. Don't don't show, show this to anybody. This is my. You do know this is on a panel, right? You know this, this is, is going out to a con, dude. Ah, to hell with it. <laughs> I'm doing a mysterious island uh, oh. crab sequence, and it's I like at the Maple Town Theater in Maple Heights, Ohio. Oh, uh, the first week it came out. <laughs> I, I love that. I, that's my. That is to me is so 
science fiction-y and weird. Crabs are already science fiction just by their very nature. And when I saw that as a little kid, I just about had a heart attack. I was so happy seeing that. So, uh, and I did drawings, you know, little stick figures chasing this crab and all that stuff, but uh, all these years later, but that that's a lot of work. That's like- Oh, no, of course it is. I, the, I, my style was much more uh, impressionistic and uh, uh, although I'd love to be a, you know- I love impressionism. Impressionism is the well, way that, you learn color. Someday I'll show you uh, privately some of my, my efforts and you can uh, tell me where- It's I'm, good. <laughs> It's the, so uh, but I was, uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm just amazed at, uh, but no, if I, if I, if I knew you when, uh, if you were in my neighborhood, when, uh, I was uh, a monster kid, I think I, uh, have you locked up in my basement oh, doing a mission for me. Uh, well, we're finding out more about this tonight than really? we ever thought we would. <laughs> you would have no, a I mean. Well, it's sort of like the whole Ray Harry. Don't you think it's amazing that Ray Harryhausen and Forey Ackerman and Ray Bradbury all kind of knew each other as very young people? And look at them. Look at they all achieved. It. They went off in separate directions, but they all achieved greatness. But they were buddies. As as, as yeah. I don't know if they were children, but they were close to kids. I think. I think well, they, yeah, and and so did the um, you know the uh, you know the 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 figure of sons and daughters of uh, you know Forey Ackerman and. And, sure. and Bradbury, um, you know, we were the, the Monster Kid generation. There, look at the number of uh, major, major talents in Hollywood who got their start, their initial inspiration with uh, these old Universal monster movies. Yeah. And I mean, we a lot of us made our own, you know, eight millimeter productions. I in did. The back. I still got mine. Yep. I did, and and uh and some of us became steven spielberg not all of us <laughs> but <laughs> but uh we were the first generation that took control of media i think that's that's there, there was a big change we, we weren't passive consumers yeah. we were very active uh, uh manipulators of it and uh a lot of us have had just very interesting careers in the, the i mean it's it's a it's a kind of an archetypal childhood that you uh you run into people all the time in places you'd never expect and and um, the subject of um, you know famous monsters comes up and and the memories come you know come come pouring out and it uh, it really didn't For bind sure. i agree generation. completely yeah yeah and and it's really cool i'm going to bring it back around guys watch this uh and it's really and and you and you and you capture that great feeling in this new book so, uh, um, and uh, look, I'm glad we got, could bring you two together. Um, so, and, and Mike- It's a match we, made it in heaven, if, basically. If we do want, you know- It's a Madison match made in the basement. If we do want- get, if we'll, we get, do want we'll, get, we'll get locked up in my basement sometime. If we want Maddox to disappear for a while, we've got our man now, so- Hey, hey Mike, Mike, just this go watch Cat People so much. again. Just go, watch, just go watch Cat People again, okay? You only right, saw I'll it be, once. I'll be, I'll be- <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i got a few of these more to uh to watch this month as well so um look cool. it's it's been wonderful having you guys both on uh appreciate it and um david um i know that the people can get the book at uh turner classic movies their website but i know that you were also offering um a link to autograph copies correct yeah, the, usually at this time of the year, I'm traveling around the country, uh, autographing books and giving lectures and and uh, meeting people and you know, face to face. That isn't happening this year, so I've designated uh, you know America's uh, number one horror emporium, Dark Delicacies in Burbank, California, and they are Dark Dell One L Dark Dell dot com, and I'm stopping in there weekly to sign people's uh, autograph. Uh, uh, requests and I, I've already broken several records with. I, I've been uh, signing books for, for for them for years and years and years. But uh, uh, there seems to have been a pent up demand, and I'm uh, <laughs> I'm I'm up to nearly 150 copies out of that one store, and that's I hope it's doing that well across the country. But uh, anyway, they will they will take care of it, and they are an independent bookstore. And that's very important. Yes. Uh, a yeah. lot, a lot of uh, uh, people are just kind of walking the edge right now, 
and a lot it's it's like the, the whole cultural sector is being being wiped out you know as a result of this uh, this pandemic and uh, you know and may, uh, a lot of it's just going to go and not come back that yeah. includes bookstores but theater companies and and all kinds of other things that uh, have been a central part of my life uh, since time immemorial and uh, I uh, the show must go on the monster yes. show on, well, so let's yes the monster show will definitely go on unfortunately we're out of time here but we will definitely have a link uh, in our show notes on the podcast for that so people can go there and speaking of helping out again uh, as far as Monsterama goes, this year's virtual event is a fundraiser for Motion Picture and Television Fund. MPTF supports our entertainment community in living and aging well with dignity and purpose and in helping each other in times of need. If you love movies and the people who make them like we do, please donate. And again, all you have to do is go to uh, Monsterama's website and click on the link and uh, donate to your heart's content. So uh Thank you, Mark. Thank you, David. Appreciate your time today. And it was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. I love being on here. It's great seeing David again, too. Absolutely. And hopefully we can all do this again in person sometime, sometime. Next, next year. <laughs> Any, hopefully uh, next year. Uh, when you when you can't uh, locate Mr. Maddox, uh, maybe we can show him uh, uh, chained to an easel down in my garage. Uh, <laughs> We'll somebody to, somebody we'll, call we'll, the cops we'll know who to look for <laughs> work you know, as Karloff said to colin klein don't sleep work <laughs> thank you so much that's the way it is <laughs> cool <laughs>